All right. Welcome, everybody. We're into our next unit, which is going to be on polymers and polymer chemistry. So we're kind of moving, I guess, like we've moved through several chapters on gases. We moved through the water chapter, which is focusing on liquids. So we're kind of going through a bit of a theme and we're moving into polymers, which by and large are solids. So we're kind of moving into the next phase of matter thematically. If my sound is bad online, let me know. Otherwise, I'm going to assume I'm okay. So just a few housekeeping things. I did send an email out yesterday with kind of a, uh, I guess a solution if you have missed any of the unit assignments to this point. And I hopefully laid out pretty clearly in the email and in the description on the link, if you see it on the ACORN page, the link that describes what that sounds like, what that sounds like, what that looks like. Uh, please, please check that out if that applies to you. Um, I did kind of deliberately make that require more work than just having done the assignment in the first place. So, so, so clearly the best option is to just do the assignments as de designated and so on. But if something came up some particular week or you, something got missed, whatever, uh, this does give you that opportunity to make one of those up and just one of those. Uh, just to notice too that our deadline is coming up for the second assignment, which the deadline is set for April 1st, and it's not an April Fool's joke. It's actually April 1st, which I believe is a Thursday. And I set the deadline for the Thursday previous to that, which is this Thursday, to make any requests for non-video options. And if you have an idea, please let me know and pat, run it by me. I will not be approving them after Thursday. And that's because I don't want people realizing last minute that it's going to be too much effort to get a video together, so I need another option. Too bad. You need a video unless you, get, you pitch the idea well in advance. Um, I had another piece to that thought. Um, that's this Thursday, so please make sure that is when you let me know by. What was the other part of that? Um, they've already been coming in. I've got about maybe 20 or so videos so far. A range from ones that are done by groups versus done by individuals. Either is okay. I don't know if I have any more thoughts on that. If something strikes me, I'll, I'll mention it. But yeah, don't forget about assignment two, which really is kind of, you're going to be your last required thing except for the final exam, which is also coming up fairly soon. But no big deal. The exam won't be, won't be too, too hard. By the way, the alternative I put up for the unit assignments, you know, there's two options. If you read them, one of those options is to come up with your own multiple choice questions, different from the ones that I put up already, posted in class. And I'm told that you can go back and see those easily so you can tell what ones have been posted already. Uh, also, I don't want a bunch of like similar questions on a given subtopic. So, you know, like let's say your subtopic is element symbols. I don't want question one, what element is symbol S? And then question two, what element is symbol C? Question three, what element is symbol H? You know, that's the same question multiple times. They have to be very different and span the units. Cool? Great. Really the goal here, the idea, is to get you to watch those lectures that you didn't do the assignments for. So yeah, go through them and come up with some questions, please. Great. Hopefully that is self-explanatory. I think all the grades are now up for assignment one, so all the kind of straggler ones have been dealt with. If you haven't checked your grade yet, please make sure you do. If there's any issues with those, I currently know of no outstanding issues with any of the grades. so. If you feel there's something wrong with your grade, uh, now would be the time to let me know about that. And let's jump into our next chapter. We have a new unit assignment for this particular unit, and that unit assignment has gone live six minutes ago. So you can open that up and go along. We have another nine questions or so, which I believe brings us to 92 total questions for the year. And I told you it was going to be somewhere around 100. Looks like we'll pass 100, which is good. Um, 
It just means the more questions we have, the less each individual question will be worth. Which is great if you've been missing some of them because there's more to make up. So we're going to be looking at a class of molecules in this unit that we call polymers. Here's my first mistake on slide one. This is unit 10, not unit 9. Um, I, I forgot to carry over the numbering from the previous year. We're going to be looking at chemically what polymers are made out of, what some of their properties are, what some of the issues are around these are, certainly when it comes to environmental or possibly health issues. You know, we all use them ubiquitously every day, uh, but of course, if not handled properly, they can end up in natural systems, which can cause all sorts of havoc. So our definition of polymers to begin with it are molecules that are made by linking together many individual small subunits. And these subunits we have a name for, we call them monomers. Mono means one, and mer means, I don't know, like unit or something like that. I don't know, I'm not uh, an etymologist. But these monomers, you can think of them as being a little bit like a, an individual bead. And you can chain these beads together to make, you know, you can link them together to make a long chain, and the chain we might refer to as a polymer. So a polymer really is a molecule made up by small subunits called monomers that repeat over and over and over and over again. And the way I have them drawn here is sort of like beads like on a chain, but they don't have to be straight stringy chains, they can be branched as well. Come back to me, there we go. Uh, you can have branch chains, which we would also call polymers. As long as you have a repeating subunit, we call these things polymers for many units. Uh, there's actually sort of an intermediate between monomer and polymer that we call oligomer. And olig, oligi, olig, that, that means the few. So if you have a few units, and I guess what that actually means in terms of number depends on the molecule or the application. Generally, if you have like 10 or 20 links in a row, we might not call that a polymer. We might call it still a relatively small molecule. We might call it an oligomer in that situation. So we have all kinds of naturally occurring polymers. Cellulose is an example. So cellulose is made up chemically of these little subunits here, which is called a, a cellobios unit. And that unit then gets linked in a chain and repeated again and again and again and again. And so we have this, these kind of like square brackets with an N here. And the N just means that subunit within the brackets is getting repeated over and over and over and over again some number of times. And for many molecules, things like cellulose, this, that value of N could be over a thousand. You could have thousands of these subunits all linked together to make these very, very long stringy molecules, which can then kind of be bundled together. And so you see here in a plant fiber, like a fiber might be something you would see in uh, cotton, for example, if you went down to the individual fibers and you could stretch them out, or your hair is like a fiber, long and thin. In uh, cellulose fibers, which cotton would be made out of, the individual molecule makes these strings which bundle together in a d bunch of different sort of levels to end up with the actual fiber of that strand of uh, cotton that you'd be looking for. So there you go. That's what a polymer is. They're naturally occurring. Cellulose is one natural example. There's many other examples of naturally occurring polymers. We would say that uh, nucleic acids like DNA and RNA are examples of naturally occurring polymers. You have this subunit, which is made out of three parts. There's the phosphate part, there's the sugar part, and then there's the base part, the DNA base. And we have a set of four possible subunits. Those bases can vary. There's four different ones uh, for DNA and then uh, a similar set, but slightly different for RNA. So one of those pieces, one of those subunits, which has the phosphate, the sugar, and the base, we would call a monomer. Link many of these together in a chain and you have either a strand of DNA or RNA. The difference between DNA and RNA 
is this OH right here. That OH is present in RNA, but not in DNA. And actually that OH makes this molecule fall apart a lot easier. So RNA is much less stable than DNA, uh, which is why these new vaccines they have that are RNA vaccines for COVID require refrigeration at such low temperatures, because RNA is a very fragile molecule. It won't survive in the fridge for any significant period of time, all because of this single OH molecule. DNA, it's deoxyribonucleic acid, so they've removed that oxygen. By they, I mean, I don't know, nature, I guess. Uh, that's missing, so DNA doesn't degrade nearly as easily as RNA, which is great because it's designed for long-term storage of genetic information. Great, so we have naturally occurring polymers. Proteins are another example of naturally occurring polymers. Proteins are very long strings or strands where it's very much like a, a chain with pearls on it or beads on it. And these chains can kind of bunch up and form these little balls, which we call uh, globular proteins. There's other shapes that they can take on. But effectively at the, at the atomic level, what proteins are, are just these chains of individual monomers that are linked together. Those individual subunits are called amino acids. And we have a natural set of 20 amino acids that can be used, which can make a bewilderingly large variety of different possible protein structures. So these are all the different amino acids that are naturally occurring. There's 20 of them that organisms use. There's a few others that are uh, occasionally found in addition to these 20 ones that result from uh, modification of proteins that are already made, some of them, but you can see the different names of them. They all have different structures. They all have one unit in common, which is this NH2 carbon COOH. And this is sort of side chain part that varies between them. And you get ones like this, you have like a chain on the side that has a branch so we call those branch chain amino acids, or BCAAs. It's a bunch of different ones. So you chain these together any order you want, and you'll get a protein. And the order in which they are arranged in naturally occurring proteins is coded based on um, the, the uh, sequence of bases you get on the RNA that comes from the DNA. So polymers make polymers inside our bodies. So, um, I, I always mean to fix this slide. Um, hemoglobin is a protein. It's a protein that's found in our blood, and it's the protein that's responsible for carrying oxygen throughout our body. It, blood is carried to our, or it's pumped by our heart to our lungs, where it comes into contact with air, can absorb oxygen, and then carry it through the body. Um, hemoglobin is actually, made out of four subunits, and each of those subunits are single long chains of amino acids that fall up together. And then those four come together and form one molecule of hemoglobin, and one molecule of hemoglobin will have four irons in it, which will carry uh, four oxygen molecules. The reason I mean to fix this slide is I have a picture, this is how the protein is sometimes drawn, where you know, you can see that little red kind of chain that goes through here is the amino acid chain. And then it has these sort of ribbon-like structures. That's just still the same chain continued, but this way of depicting these long amino acid chains. The reason it needs to be fixed is I have a piece of meat here. Um, hemoglobin is not what makes meat red. Hemoglobin is what makes our blood red but just because meat is red doesn't mean it's bloody. It's red because of a, a different but related protein called myoglobin. So which basically is like one quarter of hemoglobin, it's myoglobin. So we have a question. What do we call the individual small molecules that are linked together to make polymers? We call these monomers, which is B. And the next question, which of the following is not a naturally occurring polymer? So we know that DNA and RNA are naturally occurring polymers. We know that proteins are too. Latex is actually another example of a naturally occurring polymer. Used to make rubber or natural rubber. Uh, starch is also 
a naturally occurring polymer. It's made out of sugar units repeated again and again and again and again. So the correct answer here is estrogen. We looked at the structure of estrogen in the water chapter because we were comparing it to the structure of um, BPA. And they have some similarities in their structures which causes BPA to, to sort of act a little bit like um, estradiol. This is a picture of latex, by the way, being harvested from a tree. I think it's a tree or a bush, plant, I don't know. So synthetic polymers are probably what we're going to focus most on in this unit. And by probably, I mean definitely because I'm, I made the unit and I know what's in it. Um, synthetic polymers are ones that are made by human beings, right? They're not ones that are naturally found out in the world, but we have created them and put them out there into the world in, generally speaking, huge amounts. The very first synthetic polymer was actually what we might call a semi-synthetic polymer, which means it was uh, a, a natural polymer that was then modified. So it wasn't a whole new polymer substance that would never existed. They took an existing substance, which was cellulose, and treated it with um, nitric acid. And apparently the way the story goes is uh, in 1846, there was a chemist who at the time, I think the way a lot of chemistry was done was people kind of, it was like a hobby and people didn't have labs and they didn't have fume hoods and they didn't have all the safety regulations and equipment that we have in our building down in Elliot Hall. What they would often do is do it in their garage or do it in their kitchen or those sorts of things. That's very frowned upon today, both for safety reasons and because a lot of illegal activity is done that way too. There's laws, especially in the states, very tight laws around what you're allowed to do in your house. You can't distill alcohol as one example. Uh, 1846, uh, the, the way the story goes is apparently somebody was doing chemistry in their own kitchen and they had a big wooden kitchen table and they had a bottle of nitric acid and I don't know what they were doing, mixing something on the stove and they accidentally knocked over the bottle of nitric acid onto the table and they did what I guess anyone would probably do is they immediately grabbed a cloth, like a dish towel, threw it, soaked up all the acid, and then balled it up and threw it in the sink. And then they took wet cloths and they washed the table off because nitric acid will eat through, it'll, it'll damage the surface of the table. So they're trying to save the table as much as possible. The afterthought was what happened to the cloth. And the cloth was just a cotton dishcloth, dish towel, nothing special about it. And after it sat there soaking in nitric acid for a period of time while he dealt with the immediate problem, which is the mess on the table. Uh, he then turned the, turned the sink on, assume, assume it was indoor plumbing for the sake of this story, uh, rinsed out all the acid, cleaned it as best he could, and he um, put it over next to the fireplace. He hung it up. He had a little, little, uh, kind of like a little clothesline thing around the fireplace because he wanted to dry it out. Great. He was sitting there, and all of a sudden, a little spark from the fireplace, like a little piece of wood popped or cracked and a little spark flew out of the fireplace, just touched the cloth that was there that was by this time dry and it just immediately burst into flames and then disappeared. There was nothing left, nothing visible. There was no ash, there was no smoke. It just like went foop into fire and then was gone. And he became very interested in what went on here. Um, very flammable substances were relatively rare, I would say. Um, and he was also very interested in the fact that it didn't create any smoke. What had actually happened is the cloth itself was made out of cotton fibers. Those cotton fibers are almost 100% cellulose and cellulose will react when treated with nitric acid and soaked for a period of time to make a polymer called nitrocellulose, which has this subunit repeated thousands of times. So it's a modification of cellulose where OHs are replaced with these O and O3 groups. Okay, so added these nitro groups. And what that actually does 
you know, cellulose will burn. If you took a cloth or you took, you know, an old shirt or something made out of cotton and threw it in a fire, it will catch on fire, it'll burn, it'll give off heat and so on. Um, however, in order for it to burn, it must come into contact with oxygen and the oxygen, it can only burn so quick because oxygen can only get to it at a certain rate. If you use pure oxygen, it would burn a lot faster, but in our atmosphere, which is around 20% oxygen, the burning was not that fast. With the nitrocellulose though, is these nitro groups that are attached to the molecule substitute for the oxygen in the combustion process. And you don't have to wait for the nitrogen or the oxidant to get there, it's attached right to the molecules right on the chain. So this will burn very, very rapidly because it does not have to wait for oxygen to come. It doesn't need oxygen at all, it'll burn within itself. And it burns almost explosively fast. So very quickly, people realized an application for this, which was a substitute for gunpowder. And what people used at the time for gunpowder uh, was what we might call black powder. And it was very literally black because it contained charcoal. And the, fi the, fi the gunpowder was such that if you struck it or lit it on fire or whatever, it would explode, but it would create a big puff of black smoke. So if you had a weapon that f used this gunpowder, you could not really effectively do guerrilla warfare because as soon as you took one shot, this big cloud of smoke gives away your position and makes you then a potentially easy target. This type though, it exploded like gunpowder, exploded very explosively when you grind it up into a powder. However, it did not create a puff of smoke. So this was considered to be smokeless gunpowder and it was seen as an, uh, as an improvement to the existing gunpowder at the time. So it found use in weapons applications almost right away. Which, I don't know, that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, nitrocellulose also allowed the birth of the film industry. So there's a material that's mostly nitrocellulose, about 80% nitrocellulose, 20%, the remaining 20% is a substance called camphor. If you mix those two together, you get a material called celluloid. And celluloid is like a clear plastic, it's flexible, and it's what was used to make early movies. Like it was the film reel, you know, it was the material that the little images were printed on. They knew at this point in time, before this was invented, they knew how to create a picture on a piece of glass. But you can't, glass isn't flexible. You couldn't make a movie using glass slides. You need flexible plastic slides that you can put on a reel and spin very rapidly to create this illusion from still images of a moving picture, really. And so it was nitrocellulose that allowed this industry to take off, because if you can't, record moving pictures, then you can't have a movie industry at all. Now celluloid, because it is 80% uh, this nitrocellulose, which also went by the name gun cotton, uh, what that mean, meant is that the, this film was extremely flammable. And this was a real issue if you were, say, working in, a, in one of those early movie theaters where this is how movies were stored because typically they'd have rooms with many, many reels in these, black, in these like metal cases. If the fire broke out, it could very, very quickly accelerate and could, you know, take down a whole building very quickly. And this was somewhat common, these fires that would take place inside movie theaters and there's many disasters from the early days. We don't have that anymore. We don't have celluloid material. We don't have film uh, done this way. But it was an issue because they had very bright lamps which could get very hot and they had film moving in front of these lamps. It wouldn't have taken a whole lot, just a spark, to make this whole thing go up in smoke, literally. Well, actually no smoke because it's smokeless. But it would be smoky once, of course, it started catching the walls and all this kind of thing on fire. If you've ever seen the movie Inglorious Bastards, um, the high flammability of celluloid uh, plays a role in the plot without giving too much away. It's a Quentin Tarantino film. 
So nitrocellulose, we kind of retired out of use. We don't really use it in, uh, in movies anymore in, for, for doing recording because we, I think everything's pretty well digital now. Uh, even before it was digital, it was probably magnetic analog tape. Um, but we also still do use nitrocellulose for a couple of applications. The first one is ping pong balls. Ping pong balls are still made out of nitrocellulose. So if you want to get a sense of what this material as a pure material feels like, uh, just pick up a ping pong ball and kind of like squish it a little bit maybe. It's, it's kind of like a little bit stiff and brittle, like it'll hold its shape. It's not squishy like a rubber ball, but uh, at the same time, it's, it's quite flexible. Right, which is sort of the perfect material. And, and by the way, I learned this as a kid. We had a, a fireplace in our basement, and I don't know why, like maybe I was a born chemist, but I was always obsessed with fire and seeing how things burn. And we used to like throw things in the fireplace to see what happened. And imagine our surprise when we threw in a ping pong ball and it just went like, like it, it burns extremely quickly. And so there you go. If you, if you want a, a nice idea for a demo, get some ping pong balls and do it outside, do it safely. Um, guitar picks are often made out of nitrocellulose too, mainly because for a guitar pick, you want it to be firm but flexible. Like it, you need sort of the right degree of flexibility in the plastic. Use a quote we always use in our house, firm but not too firm, just like the Lord. That's a quote from uh, Clone High, if anyone's ever even heard of Clone High before. Great show. Judging from the six people in the room, five people in the room. I guess six if you count me. So nitrocellulose was the first, I guess, partly at least, synthetic polymer that found certainly application in many different objects uh, and certainly in warfare as well. First synthetic polymer, completely synthetic polymer, was a material called Bakelite. And this was first made in 1907. And you know, this sounds like a long time ago, but it's only a little more than 100 years ago. And, and you, you kind of think like, if you went back just to 1907, before that, there was essentially no plastic of any sort being used anywhere. And it's actually pretty interesting too, like a, a common thing in Nova Scotia before widespread garbage pickup, for example, especially in Nova Scotia because so much of where people live is close to the water, a common way of getting rid of garbage was loaded up onto a boat, take the boat out, you know, a few hundred meters from shore and then just dump it over. Which today sounds almost unthinkably irresponsible, but at the time, what would have been in their garbage? Food scraps, okay, paper, paper, that's not gonna last any time out in the ocean then probably glass and metal cans. Metal cans would corrode very rapidly in a saltwater environment, and glass actually would get broken up, and that's, when you go to Nova Scotia beaches and you find beach glass, that's likely what you're finding, is garbage from 50 to 100 years ago. But now, so much of our garbage is plastic that you would never even imagine, hopefully, dumping your garbage out into the ocean, because it, it's not gonna go away. So really all that plastic that we have is mostly generated within the last hundred years, which is a short time, relatively speaking. So Bakelite was made in 1907. We actually have a lab in Organic Chem in second year where we make this particular plastic. And it turn, it, the plastic that you get is very dense, hard, and brittle. And it's used to make poker chips still. So if you can think of a poker chip and how kind of heavy and hard that is, um, the original poker chips were made out of clay, which was fine, except if you dropped a clay pro poker chip, it would break, or could break, whereas this Bakelite is very hard, very durable, and you could throw it as hard as you could against a cement wall, and it's not, nothing's gonna have to, it's gonna bounce right off. So you could use it to make this. It was also used to make like dishes, uh, not pots, you couldn't heat this or it would melt, but certainly things like dishes or glasses or cups or things like that, that kind of hard, dense, brittle material that you could use. Following this, in 1907, came an explosion in interest, an explosion in research towards making new plastics and new polymers. 
almost all of the common polymers that we use now were developed sort of in the decades shortly after Bakelite was generated. Um, DuPont is a big chemical company, was a big chemical company back then and still is today. They were very interested in the commercial applications of new plastics for replacing materials that were generally hard to come by or very expensive. So trees are used to make paper. Not that paper is like super expensive, but it's not maybe ideal for carrying your groceries home because it can rip easily, it can be heavy, you know, it's got, they're looking for substitutes for that. Looking for substitutes for expensive fabrics. Things like silk, which was a fabric that was highly prized but very expensive and difficult to get. Um, even cotton wasn't always necessarily the easiest thing to come by. And, and many, many other materials, right? Like celluloid, which allowed the film industry. They were trying to come up with new materials to generate a whole bunch of new possible applications. So DuPont created an experimental station, which is basically like a, a, like a research facility where they're gonna do research to try to generate new polymers. And they were very interested in attracting one scientist in particular named Wallace Carruthers, who was a professor at Harvard. And they were very interested in having him come and become, a, become the lead of their research team because he was a world expert at the time in polymer chemistry. Uh, they had a very difficult time though attracting him. And the reason was is that Wallace Carruthers suffered greatly from mental health issues, which certainly at the time were not very well appreciated by most people and certainly uh, supports and uh, the types of care that are hopefully more ubiquitous today were not in place for people like him at that point in time. And uh, I believe I had the exact quote here somewhere that he said, he told them, if I can find it. Uh, but initially he turned down their offer. They offered, made him a big offer actually. They're, so they they're offered him a competitive salary with what he was already making at Harvard. Um, okay, I do have it here, the exact quote. was, I suffer from neurotic spells of diminished capacity, which might constitute a much more serious handicap there in private industry than it is here at the university. So he realized that his mental health struggles at the time um, made his life difficult, but at least he could continue to do his job uh, at Harvard. But in private industry where they have budgets and deadlines and all this sort of structure, he, he, he didn't know if he was gonna be able to uh, be successful. But they really wanted him, they assured him uh, that you know, everything was gonna be good. They offered to double his salary, which was $500 a month, was the doubled salary. They offered him a team of workers, they offered him complete creative control over all of the research that was done in the center. The only caveat was that anything that came out as a discovery from this experimental station was the intellectual property belonged to DuPont. And DuPont could then market it as they saw fit. So he saw this, I think, as a great opportunity. He did eventually go to DuPont and he did start doing research on this new field of, of polymer chemistry. And almost immediately, in 1930, they developed the first new plastic out of the experimental station, which was then patented and sold by DuPont. It's called neoprene. And neoprene is still used widely today. It is made, it, it has this particular subunit you see right here, repeated again and again and again and again. And it's got, these are all carbons in a chain uh, with chlorines on every fourth carbon. Neoprene, when it's made, if you pump air into it, it'll make kind of a spongy foam and a, a fairly durable spongy foam. And so if you ever see these, you know, these weights that have the, the kind of the spongy grips on them, that is neoprene. Or you can also see this plastic used in these like, uh, you know, drink holders. Where the idea is they, they insulate your, your can, you can put your can inside and it'll keep them cold. 
So neoprene, if, you, if you're familiar with this material, you, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. That is uh, the first one that they came up with. Now what they were really interested in though, and what Wallace Carruthers was really interested in, and I think his name is spelled with one R, uh, was a substitute for silk. And silk was considered to be a very expensive and very stylish and very valuable fabric. And the way you make silk is you start off with an, with a, a, an insect called, which has as its pupil stage, um, they make these, there's these worms that are called silkworms. And what these silkworms do is they eat and then they spin this uh, cocoon around themselves where they would undergo metamorphosis to their next biological stage. Um, what they would do is once they spin these cocoons is they would kill them, they would uh, open them up and take the insect out. And what you're left with are these sort of like poofy cocoons. And that cocoon actually is a single strand of silk it's all kind of wrapped up, coiled up into like a ball. And so you could tease it apart and pull it out and make one really, really long strand. And with those strands, they would put several strands together and they could eventually make the fabric, the silk, out of many, 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 many strands. And so this is, you know, a lot of work to make these. You need to raise all the insects, you need to feed them. It was a very long procedure to generate silk. And silk, for that reason, was very expensive. And, you know, something extremely expensive would be like a set of bed sheets made out of silk. That would be in a crazy amount of silk to waste on something like bed sheets. Uh, a more common use for silk were stockings for women, which was a very big fashion item at the time, right? Uh, the stockings at the time, which were made out of silk, typically were not very long. Like we, we think of today of, of women's stockings that will go all the way up, but at the time they wouldn't go much above the ankle because just the material was so expensive. It was very difficult to, or it was too costly to make that. So the actual chemical structure of silk, it's a protein, just like spider silk is as well. So in 1938, Wallace Carruthers was successful, with a single R, in developing a synthetic substitute for, spy, for, uh, for silk, from silkworms. And the chemical name, we would call that polyamide 6, 6, uh, but it's better known as nylon. And they immediately went into production in the form of women's stockings, which now we kind of use synonymously with the word nylon. So if you're wearing nylons, really what you're wearing are these stockings, which previous to this invention were all made out of silk. And it's actually very interesting when you think of um, cultural shifts that are enabled by changes in our technology, advances in our technology. And we already kind of suggested that the birth of the film industry was made possible by the development of celluloid made from nitrocellulose. Um, another uh, change in society that people believed came about was the length of women's dresses, where Prior to the development of nylon in 1938, the, the prevailing fashion was for women's dresses to be very long, typically to not go um, above the ankle. And the reason was is that the nylons that were available at the time, there was a taboo against showing skin, the nylons that were av available at the time rarely went above the ankles very far because the silk was so expensive. To make long nylons seemed sinfully wasteful to a lot of people. And having actual bare skin showing at the time was probably unthinkable. But when nylons came out and replaced the silk stockings, they were no longer bound by the high expense of silk, and the nylons could be made longer and longer and longer, which allowed dresses to become shorter and shorter and shorter. So when these came out at first, they were a huge hit. They came in these cans, and the cans would have, in this example, two pairs, and the two pairs were in the can along with a pencil like a charcoal pencil. And the reason for the charcoal pencil is that these were made as one piece, one continuous piece, whereas the silk ones were made from like a sheet which were wrapped into the shape of your, of your foot and then sewed up the back. So actual real silk, uh, nylons I almost called them, but silk stockings would have had a seam that ran up the back 
which indicated they were made out of real silk. Where these nylons, the ones were made out of plastic, didn't have those anymore. So the idea behind having the pencil put in with the can is that once you put them on, you pull them up, you could then draw in a fake seam so that people would think they were real silk. But it turns out that people were way more interested in having the real nylons than they were in having the old fashioned fuddy-duddy silk stockings. And so people just chucked the pencils. They, didn't, they wanted everyone to know that they had a real pair of actual nylons. So I believe these went on sale in 1938 in the US first, and they um, actually never went on sale beyond there, at least anytime soon. Um, what happened is when they went on sale, I forget the exact prices, but they were like a dollar a can in 1938 dollars, which I don't know what that even translates to today. But they were only on sale for a short period of time, a number of months, before they were completely pulled off the market. And the reason they were pulled off the market was because of a big event that happened in 1939, which was World War II. And it turns out nylon was a fantastic fabric for making parachutes because it was lightweight, it was strong, uh, and, and, and the powers that be, the powers at the time, realized that this was a more pressing need, and 100% of the nylon production from DuPont went towards um, making parachutes for, for the US. I think initially it was for the British military, it was for sale, because the US didn't join World War II immediately in 1939. It came in a few years later. But I'll tell you what this did, is it drove up the demand and the cachet of having the nylon stockings because all of a sudden were they not only new, but they were also rare. And I wonder if the long-term success of nylon as a material for stockings was in part um, bolstered by the fact that they were very exclusive initially because they were very hard to get and then all of a sudden they were no longer on sale. It's like the, what are this, the Tickle Me Elmo phenomenon. Tickle Me Elmo came out and then, I don't know if it was intentional or not, but for some reason they had like way less supply than there was demand. And then they ran out everywhere and then all of a sudden everyone was frantic to get one. And you still see this with like video game consoles, like PS5 when it came out before Christmas. Actually, and, and early on in the pandemic, the Nintendo Switch, all of a sudden were sold out everywhere because everyone was stuck at home looking for one. And even though it wasn't new, there suddenly wasn't the supply, and then all of a sudden the, the demand went way up. Not just because of the pandemic, because of this artificial, uh, this artificial. So yeah, that would be $25 in today's dollars, would be a dollar back in 1938, good to know. So yeah, that was nylon. And, and needless to say, this made a huge amount of money for DuPont. Um, the story with Wallace Carruthers though, uh, even though he was about as successful as you could expect to be as a chemist working in industry, he created one of the most popular and useful products that we know of. Um, Wallace Crothers, um, he ended up taking his own life. He ended up committing suicide and never overcoming his mental health struggles. Uh, he was talking in 1932, and this is what, what he said. He went up to, I went up to New Haven during the holidays and made a speech at the Organic Symposium, which would be a conference. It was pretty well received, but the prospect of having to make it ruined the preceding weeks, and it was necessary to resort to considerable amounts of alcohol to quiet my nerves for the occasion. My nervousness, moroseness, vacillation got worse as time went on, and the frequent resort to drinking doesn't bring about any permanent improvement. That whole year looks pretty much black to me just now. So he, you know, had certain mental health struggles, which he was also well aware of, but really there, uh, just at the time, there just wasn't the supports put in place and it ended up tragic for him, for sure. All right, so we're gonna talk about, we're gonna kind of pivot a little bit now to one of the main problems with the production of plastics, while they do bring many useful products and, as we've seen, can potentially lead to transformations in society in various ways. Um, 
at the end of the day, you have this material that is very difficult to get rid of. It doesn't decay very easily. Typically, most plastics will have a very, very long lifetime, very persistent. So here's a picture, and this is all plastic waste, uh, bits of plastic that were pulled out of the Pacific Ocean. And I'm gonna zoom out. This is a piece of art. Zoom out one more time. So this is a, a, a piece of art that's made from 2.4 million individual pieces of plastic that are being used here to cre recreate a very famous painting. And the number of pieces of plastic here, this 2.4 million pieces, you know, if you zoom in, you can see them and how many there are. That's the number of pounds of plastic that are entering our oceans each hour, which is a staggeringly large number, right? Like I just mentioned a little while ago, it's almost unthinkable that we would go out and dump our garbage out into the ocean. Um, unfortunately, that's not the, the case in many parts of the world. There's a tremendous amount of garbage entering our oceans all the time. And unlike paper or food scraps or things like that, it does not decay and break down rapidly at all. And what we have actually set up in different parts of the world are what we call um, garbage patches in the oceans. And in the uh, Pacific Ocean in particular, there's two, one closer to Japan. Uh, and then there's the larger one, which is called the Eastern Pacific Garbage Patch. And the concentration of garbage here is around five kilograms per square kilometer, which actually, if you think about how big a square kilometer is, this is, uh, it's not like you're gonna be wading through plastic or anything here. If you swam across that square kilometer, you'd be lucky to find an individual piece. But certainly at a concentration over this entire region, that is a huge, enormous amount of plastic. And it's just because of ocean currents, they, they have a tendency to concentrate garbage in these relatively small patches. I mean, they're, they're large patches, but uh, they tend to find much more in those parts of the oceans than in other places. <coughs> So there's several issues with having this plastic in the ocean. The main issue is that wildlife that's in the ocean will end up eating it, mistaking it for food. Um, so this is an example of a, an albatross that was found dead. I believe this was in South America towards the southern tip. And you can see that the bird has died and passed away. And, and what you can see inside is all kinds of bits of plastic that the bird had consumed. So it's, it's uh, you know, not for sure, I guess, but it's pretty likely that this bird consumed this plastic, filled its gut with plastic that could not be digested or easily expelled back out, and that may have what led to this bird's ultimate demise. Then there's no space for food, right? So a lot of the different products that can end up in our ocean can last for, for many, many, many years. If you take something just like a, an apple core, it's pretty blurry there, but I think that's, like two weeks, if that, right? If something that ate apples were in there, it has almost no lifetime. Things like cardboard, things like plastic, typically don't last very long in there uh, at all. But things like plastic that are plastic like bottles, these kind of rings, um, fishing line, you see a lot of that around here, styrofoam cups. These can last decades or in many cases, multiple centuries where they may break down into smaller pieces, but they're still gonna be present and they build up. Given that all of the plastic that's in our ocean now has entered it in the last 100 years. Because plastics didn't really exist prior to that. <clears throat> what happens with this plastic too is much of it is present in the form of microplastics. And microplastics are defined as pieces of plastic where the diameter is uh, less than five millimeters. So this on the guy's or lady's fingertip here, this person's fingertip, all these little bits here are individual bits of plastic that would qualify as uh, microplastics. And microplastics can become so small that you can't actually see them with your own eyes. They can be microscopic. And all those large pieces of plastic will eventually break down into these microplastics. And these bits of microplastic look like small, maybe microorganisms that might be food for many things that live in the water. Uh, microplastics don't only come from larger plastic items that break down. Some products deliberately have microplastics in them. This was, uh, I think these are mostly phased out, 
But for a while, there were, um, it was very popular to have body washes that had little like gritty bits of plastic in it. Um, I remember they were called micro scrubbers. And the idea was by having those little bits of plastic, it made it a little bit gritty. And if you were washing your arm or your skin, it's, it would kind of help uh, exfoliate maybe your skin a little bit. Uh, but of course that all went down the drain and much of that ended up in the ocean, which is compounding the problem for something basically completely unnecessary. Other sources of microplastics, actually you can have what are called microfibers, which are, you know, little string-like ones and every time you wash your clothing and it tumbles around in there and that water goes down the drain, that will have microfibers in it from your clothing. And you can see those microfibers when you put it in the dryer and it tumbles and spins and then you pull out all that dryer lint. That dryer lint is really all microfibers collected from your clothing as it dries. So around 35% of the microplastics in the ocean come from synthetic textiles, which are fabrics things like polyester, uh, other materials like that. Car tires, when you um, drive your car, your, the rubber wears down and it turns into dust, micro, microfibers, which eventually gets washed into dishes and then washed out into the ocean. Uh, random city dust, personal care products, this is reducing. They also put this kind of stuff in toothpaste to make it a better cleaning pow power and things like that. So these microplastics can be ingested by fish. If they're small enough, they can actually penetrate um, membranes, potentially get into cells. We eat fish, this ends up in our diets as, as well. So it's a potential health issue as well, the, the existence of microplastics in the ocean. Not just an environmental issue, but potentially a health issue as well. All right, here's another picture. We talked a little bit about uh, plastic drink bottles when we talked about bottled water and some of the garbage issues around that. What do we say? It was like 33 billion bottles a year in the U.S. that are used. Only about 3 billion of those get recycled. So it's 30 billion unrecycled bottles that are being produced. If we zoom out, zoom out again. It's again by the same artist named Chris Jordan. Pictured here is 2,000, or sorry, 2 million plastic bottles, which is equal to the number used in the U.S. every five minutes. Crazy, crazy number of plastic bottles getting used. The 30 billion we looked at was just for water, but of course people get all sorts of drinks in plastic bottles. This is another one, he did a whole kind of series. This is a zoomed in section on the right here, but this is 60,000 plastic bags, which is the number used in the US every five seconds. And of course in Nova Scotia, they've now banned plastic bags. Is it countrywide, that ban? No, just provincial. It's funny, I went for the groceries last night and I forgot to bring bags. And so I, all I did is I, loaded them into my cart and then I unloaded the cart right into my car. So I just had like a tr trunk full of like loose groceries. In the back of the then I had to make many, many, many trips into the house to bring them all in. Here's another picture. Um, this is not art, this one. This one is uh, the inside of a dollar store after I believe it was Hurricane Katrina in the US went through and you know, basically ripped the store apart. But just looking, like this is the contents of one store. Almost everything we're looking at here is plastic. A lot of it is packaging. A lot of it is cheap plastic items like, you know, squirt guns and things like that. It's not very hard to imagine where all this plastic that's ending up in our oceans is coming from, right? We, we look around, there's plastic everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. So it's a, you know, we produce huge, huge amounts of it. And the reason is, is it obeys you know, it, it functions very well for many of the things that we need it for. And also it's very, very cheap. And I think what we need to start doing is not only consider how expensive it is to produce something, but how expensive it is to get rid of it once you've produced it. Uh, and I don't just mean in money costs, but in, in social costs as well. And I know we do this in our chemistry building all the time, like because we order chemicals to do reactions and all this. And at the end of the day, anything we don't use, we have to dispose of. Uh, chemicals have expiry dates on them, just like medicine or food. And we have to pay companies to come take our chemical waste. And depending on the chemical, we pay different amounts. So when we're ordering chemicals, we don't only have to consider what the chemical costs, we also have to consider what it costs to get rid of it when we're done on the other end. 
So I feel like we need to be doing the same thing with the materials like plastic that we're using. Uh, and the real cost of something is not just the cost to make it, but also the cost associated with its, its entire life cycle on the other side. Um, we're starting to also consider uh, with carbon pricing costs associated with the pollution generated during making it too and shipping it as well. So people are starting to think a little more broadly in these areas, which is good. Uh, yeah, good luck passing a law for that. Yeah, no kidding. So one interesting fact about the evolution of all species on Earth is there's been this um, arms race in chemical production, chemical technology way before humans existed. Um, animals can protect themselves by fleeing from whatever the thing trying to eat them is, but plants don't have that luxury. Plants are stationary, they're stuck in one place. So the defenses that plants developed so they don't get eaten are different from the ones that animals have. Like animals are fast or they have camouflage or whatever. What plants have, I guess some plants might have thorns and things like that, but many of them, their defenses are chemical. They develop, they evolve the ability to create toxic substances that don't affect its own growth, but affect the, but, but might kill something that would eat them. And we see this all the time, like uh, nicotine that's in tobacco is produced by the plant to keep insects from eating the plant. It's actually a natural pesticide. So that's the purpose of the plant. That's the only reason it makes that, that thing. But what always happens is as soon as a plant evolves a new chemical defense against something that eats it, some animal evolves that can then eat that plant that has protection against that substance. So this is this arms race between the, the chemical defenses of the plants and then the ability of the endocrine systems of the um, animals eating them to then process or deal with that new chemical. Um, so one other thing that we, we know is that every carbon-based molecule that ever has evolved, that's produced by plants or really any other thing, some other organism has evolved that can use that as a food source. So we aren't generating um, huge amounts of biological material over the million year, millions of years of life on Earth because there's always something that'll come along that can decompose them, decomposers. So the idea is, I guess, if you think about it, if we're putting out millions and millions of tons of plastic into the environment, is that a potential food source for some yet to evolve organism that can use that carbon as a food source? And the answer to that is probably yes, but on what time scale? You know, is that a millions of years process or hundreds of years process? There are actually signs though that there have been some organisms already evolved that can eat certain types of plastics. Um, there was one, I believe it was a, a, a factory in Japan that was producing all kinds of nylon and they had this kind of like tailings pond uh, on the property where they'd put a, store a bunch of waste and they found bacteria in there that could eat nylon, that was using nylon as a food source. And uh, nylon is maybe closer to some natural compounds like proteins than some other plastics, so maybe that's a good first candidate. But it certainly does at least give hope that the plastics um, might find sometime in the future new microorganisms or could be fungi or some other things that could, that could decompose them and break them down quicker. This is a, a science fair back in 2008, the Canada-wide science fair, where the winner for that particular year was uh, a student who isolated a microorganism that can uh, decompose certain types of plastics. And this has survived. Uh, uh, my lectures that I give for this class evolve every year and stuff continuously gets chucked and added. But this has survived mainly because um, the person who came in second that year worked in my research lab. She was an Acadia student, she was a chemistry major, and uh, she knew this guy pretty well because they were in the same kind of competitions all the way up. I don't know what her project was on, I don't know uh, what second place meant. Um, but yeah, it was kind of an interesting aside there. Great, a few more questions. What highly flammable, partially synthetic polymer is used to make ping pong balls? The answer is nitrocellulose. 
Next question. I have a bit of a cat theme going on with the questions here. Uh, what silk substitute was invented by Wallace Carruthers, and this is spelled correctly, with one R, at DuPont in 1938 and immediately became a popular material in fashion? That was nylon. All of these are synthetic plastics or polymers, though, that are used to make clothing as well. So there we go. Okay, so the next kind of phase of this chapter or unit is looking at specific plastics developed since, I guess, the golden age, which was maybe the 1930s, for developing these new types of plastics, and the ones that we find most used today. And in fact, nylon doesn't crack the top five for most used plastics. Okay, we're going to look at the ones that do. They're polyethylene, polypropylene, um, PETE is another one, polyvinyl chloride, and polystyrene, I think, are the top five. We're going to look at these one by one, what they're used for, what the pros and cons of each one were, are. are. I know when I was probably a younger, like as a kid, I might have just assumed all plastics were kind of the same material somehow and didn't really appreciate the, that there was differences between them. Even though it might seem sort of obvious that like a hard plastic toy, for example, is not the same as like glad cling wrap, which is a very different kind of plastic. Um, but I certainly was not, didn't appreciate any of the structural differences. And the fact that those might have down the line differences in terms of their effects if they get out into the environment. Like a plastic shopping bag, having that blow away into the woods is that going to last as long as if it was a styrofoam cup or if it was some other type of plastic polymeric material? Um, I feel like we're roughly halfway through this unit and I, I think what I'd prefer to do is, is end a little bit early today. This is sort of a logical stopping point rather than get into these top five polymers and then finish after number two. I think I'm going to cut her off now and pick this up on, when, on Thursday. And hopefully you don't disagree with me. I guess you can disagree all you want and I'm going to do it anyway, so I'll do what I like. I got all the power, right? Also none of the power. Um, yeah, you'd be surprised how many people still think of all plastics as being basically the same material. Right, and it's completely not true, right? And actually there's lots of plastics that are finding wider and wider use that are biodegradable. Um, under ideal conditions at least. All right, so we'll talk more about this on Thursday. Thank you everyone who's here with me in person online and here in the room. And we'll hopefully see everyone again on Thursday. All right.